What's a story, amigos? This is Kino with some cool stories for today's story time. What would it be like to have a mom who's very, very different? That's in our first story. And we visit a family with a very unusual pet, a dragon. And will the coyote eat the little lamb? We'll find out in our last story. Major funding for story time is made possible by a grant from Helen and Peter Bing, so that families everywhere can share the joy of reading with their children. Additional funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. By the annual financial support from viewers like you. And by the National Endowment for Children's Educational Television. got your driver's license. <gasps> no! <laughs> oh. It's my brand new library card. I just picked it up yesterday, and I already used it, too. See, I got this book for my mom. Uh, do you have a library card, Belita? Oh, of course. I've had one since I was about six years old, and I use it all the time. I have a library card, too. Kino, I know you're going to be really good about returning those books on time. You mean... <gasps> I have to return this book? <laughs> the library only lends you these books, Kino. They don't give them to you. And you have to return them so that somebody else can read them. Oh, but, oh. but I got this book for my mom. Well, you'll have plenty of time to read this book with your mom. Yeah, and, and we can <sighs> read it over here first, right? Oh, all right. <sighs> I guess. Come on. Vamos, amigos. <laughs> Everybody. Hi. Are you all ready for stories today? Yeah! That's good. Well, I have got a book that Kino borrowed from the library, and this book is called The Trouble with Mom, and the pictures and the words are by Babette Cole. So we're going to get rolling. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Here we go. The trouble with Mom is the hats she wears. At first, the other kids gave me funny looks when she took me to my new school. <laughs> she didn't seem to get along with the other parents. Look what she turned them into. A frog. A frog. Yeah, what kind of noise do frogs make? Ribbit. 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 They kept asking me where my dad was. Mom said, he's staying put until he stops going bowling every night. Teacher asked us if our moms would make cupcakes for the PTA meeting. Mom made some. They were a disaster. But the kids thought they were brilliant. It looks like they were exploding cupcakes. Yeah. See? Look at that. There's a little worm coming out of that one. Yeah. yeah. They asked if they could come and play at my house. I didn't know what they would think of it. Their parents said they couldn't come, but they came anyway. Here are all the kids, see, going up the stairs. He's opening the door for them. They liked our pets. And they met Granny. Mom behaved very well. We all went wild. See the kids? Look, he's dancing with a snake here. <laughs> Then their parents turned up and they ruined everything. They told mom off. Mom was sad. Mm. <laughs> My new friends were fed up. They said, your mom's okay, but we're not allowed to come and play anymore. Uh-oh. <laughs> and then one day, the school caught on fire. We thought we were gonna roast. Mom beat all of the fire engines. Here she comes, zoom. 
Roxy on a broomstick, faster than the fire engines, bringing along with her clouds. Let's see what she's gonna do with the clouds. She put out the fire before any of the other parents could even arrive. See those big storm clouds she brought? They had rain in them, right? They couldn't thank her enough. Now we all go wild at my house. So what'd you think about that story? Fine. Yeah, fine? Well, what was your favorite part? Um, when they were going wild. When they went wild? Yeah. Well, well, which of his pets would you like to dance with or play with? The snake. The snake? You like snakes? No, the spider. The snake. The snake. <laughs> Ron, I don't want to be carried. Hey, look at this. What a funky place. Can we sit here? Oh, sure. I'm already sitting. Yes. Scorch! Hey! Hey, Kino, What are you doing here? Oh, I always hang out here with my friends, man. It's cool. Huh. We listen to stories and stuff. Hey, hey, did you hear I got a new library card? You've got a library card? Yeah. I want one, too. <laughs> no problem. Welcome to story time, you guys. I have the perfect book for you to read. This book is about the troubles that happened when Mrs. Belsaki told Mr. Belsaki that he was a fuddy-duddy. <laughs> okay, I want to see this book. Here, check it here. Let's here look. Go. Okay, hang on, hang on a second. All right, just calm down for a second. Folks, this, this book is called The Dragon of an Ordinary Family. Dragon? Ordinary? <laughs> there's no such thing as an ordinary dragon. It says ordinary family. How? Well. Wow. That's because there's no such thing as an ordinary dragon. <laughs> <laughs> now, this book is written by Margaret Mayhe, and the pictures are by Helen Oxenberry. You gonna read? I'm gonna read. Here we go. <laughs> Once there was a family named Belsaki. Mr. Belsaki, Mrs. Belsaki, and their little boy, Orlando Belsaki. They were very ordinary people. Their house was a very ordinary house on a very ordinary street, and no doubt, they would have led, had very ordinary lives if one morning Mrs. Belsaki hadn't called Mr. Belsaki a fuddy-duddy. <laughs> it was like this. The day began with breakfast, as usual, with Mr. Belsaki gulping down hot cereal a little late for work, as usual, and just as he was rushing out the door with his hat and his briefcase in his hand, Mrs. Belsaki called after him and said, On your way home, dear, stop off at the pet store and buy Orlando a pet. A pet, exclaimed Mr. Belsaki. What does he want a pet for? We don't have any room anyway. Nonsense, snapped Mrs. Belsaki. Of course he can have a pet, and we have room for an elephant if Orlando wants one. An elephant? Mr. Belsaki turned slightly pale, and he stared in a very foolish fashion. You're good at that. Thank you. <laughs> all right, all right, Mrs. Belsaki said impatiently. He doesn't want an elephant. But he wants a puppy, or perhaps a kitten. Now, don't be a buddy-duddy, dear. Well, Mr. Belsaki stamped out crossly, pulling his hat down over his ears, <clears throat> saying words like, buddy-duddy, buddy-duddy, indeed. On his way home from work, Mr. Belsaki went into the pet shop, and he looked around. Now, he saw white mice and hamsters, puppies and kittens, and all shapes and kinds of birds, some sad-eyed goldfish and a parrot named Joe with a sign over him that said, not for sale. Strange name, it's not his name. <laughs> Mr. Balsaki glowered and he glared around the shop. Then a sign caught his eye. It said, unusual pet, very cheap. And in small lettering underneath it said, dragon, house trained, 50 cents. Well, th that's very reasonable, said Mr. Balsaki to the pet shop man. I suppose it's not a very good breed of dragon. The pet shop man sighed and he said, it's a good breed. In fact, it's the only breed, but it's a very small one and not many people want them, you know. What? Hang on, don't get indignant. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't want a dragon? <laughs> Mr. Belsaki hesitated and the dragon blinked its violet blue eyes, at, blink your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and it stuck out its forked tongue. Ooh, gross. Okay, we won't do that. <laughs> I'll take it, said Mr. Belsaki loudly, and that's how it happened that he came home with a tiny dragon in a shoebox. What on earth is this? Mrs. Belsaki said, surprised at the noisy snuffling coming from inside the box. A dragon, replied Mr. Belsaki triumphantly. <gasps> a dragon, screamed Mrs. Belsaki. A dragon, cried Orlando in delight. It 
it was cheap, Mr. Belsaki answered, clutching the shoebox as if he was afraid Mrs. Belsaki might snatch it away. You said I was a fuddy-duddy, he added firmly, and I am no such thing. You could have chosen something pretty, Mrs. Belsaki complained. A calico kitten, perhaps, or a little bird that talks. Where are we going to keep a dragon? We have enough room for an elephant, Mr. Belsaki reminded her. So they kept the dragon. And guess what? It grew. It grew. It was a wonderful pet for Orlando. He kept it in a shoebox for a while, then in a birdcage, then in a doghouse. He even painted a tub for food with word dragon written in red. The dragon grew and grew. Mrs. Belsaki became very proud of it. Well, it certainly gives a different look to the place, she said at least once a day. It makes us a little out of the ordinary. Her friends said, what on earth did you get that for? But Mrs. Belsaki would reply, because Mr. Belsaki's a man of ideas, that's why. And she always added, he's not a fuddy-duddy like some people. The dragon grew. It finally filled almost the whole yard. It got so big that it could blow smoke and fire. It got big enough for Orlando to ride. It got as big as an elephant. Now, none of Mrs. Belsaki's friends came to visit anymore because they were afraid. The dragon grew and grew. It grew too big. One day, the mayor came to look at the Belsaki's dragon. He studied it and he studied it. It is much too big for this town, he said crossly. Mr. Belsaki, you should have an ordinary family and you should stick to ordinary pets. Mr. Belsaki, you must sell it to a zoo. Huh? Or a circus? No. Or a handbag factory? No way. Some people would pay a lot for dragon skin. <clears throat> <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Belsaki looked very worried and sad because they loved their dragon. Love, love, love. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond all doubt, it was growing too big. It was costing too much to feed, and winter was coming. We can't even afford to buy a Christmas tree or go on a vacation this year, Mr. Belsaki said gloomily. I'd rather have our pet dragon, Orlando cried. Well, you can't, the mayor answered snappishly. It's just too much. You have to get rid of it. And he marched away. As if we would sell our dragon, Mrs. Belsaki said indignantly. And we certainly don't want to make him into a handbag. No way, Jose. <laughs> if we only knew a dragon-loving farmer, we could give him to a really good farmer. Then the dragon turned and faced them, and for the first time he spoke, he did read the part of the dragon. As a matter of fact, it is getting a little cramped in here for me. Though I am very fond of you all, I feel I should move someplace else. Huh? How would you like to come with me for the Christmas holidays? Um, uh, where were you thinking of going? Mr. Balsaki asked cautiously. To the Isle of Magic, the dragon answered. All dragons know where that is. Mrs. Belsaki thought for a moment. Well, that might be right. I think I'll go pack. So the mayor and Mrs. Belsaki's friends and all the ordinary people were amazed to see Mr. and Mrs. Belsaki and Orlando soon fly away on the dragon's back, off for the Christmas holidays with their suitcases and shopping bags and baskets and boxes all tied to the dragon's tail. The dragon flew way up into the clouds. And then after a long time, it dropped down and down and down. And there below them lay the bluest sea with the Isle of Magic spread across it, all gold and green, like the summer leaves had been blown by a dreaming wind. Oh, the Isle of Magic. But what would the Balsakis do on the Isle of Magic? The dragon explained to them as they flew along that the Isle of Magic is actually the homes of all the wonderful, strange fairy tale people. So what would an ordinary family from an ordinary home on an ordinary street in an ordinary town, what would they do on an Isle of Magic? What would you do? Think about it. This is what the Belsakis did. They walked in the forests, green and gold. They saw the starry towers of castles rising above the trees and princesses sitting in the windows combing their hair. They met all kinds of sons the youngest sons of kings and millers and cobblers and beggars, all seeking their fortunes. Some days, they went sailing on a huge galleon over very shining seas, diving for pearls through the deep green water. They hunted and sailed with pirates, and they hunted for pirate treasure in the golden sand of islands, where parrots screamed and monkeys mocked in the palm trees. And all the while, the Belsakis could hear mermaids singing above the great black rocks under the lacy veil of the ocean spray. 
On other days, they searched for lost cities in twining jungles, and they found them too. Cities of ivory, cities of gold, forgotten and terribly old. Or they watched where witches twitched their broomsticks over the sky. On the far horizon, like mountains, giants moved in some mysterious business. From the windows of the castle they lived in, the Belsaki family could see the giants, and they watched them nervously. Uh, they kept their distance. When Christmas came, they sang carols around a tree covered in small candles, accommodatingly formed by hundreds of fireflies. A tree so high that a real star shivered fragile and far off at the top. Mr. Belsaki's best present was a pipe that played strange, wild music. Mrs. Belsaki got a sewing basket set with emeralds. It had an ivory thimble and a little scissors, silver shaped like a stork. Orlando got a chess set with little knights and queens and pawns which came alive and chased each other all over the board. <laughs> At last, the time came for them to go back home. The dragon stayed, of course, for the Isle of Magic is the best place for dragons. The Balsaki family sailed off on a flying carpet. And as they said farewell, the dragon gave them a farewell present, a tiny black kitten with an oversized purr. Now, said Mrs. Belsaki, she looked lovingly around her kitchen. We can settle down to being nice, ordinary people again. I'm very fond of that dragon, but I must say it'll be pleasant to relax with the neighbors again. Next Christmas, Orlando asked hopefully, can we visit the Isle of Magic and see our dragon again? Who knows, said Mrs. Belsaki a little wistfully. We may never see him again. Then she said a little sadly, I suppose we'll just have to settle down and be an ordinary family. Suddenly, the little black kitten awoke, and he sat up in Orlando's lap, and he stretched, and he said, I wouldn't be too sure of that. And then the kitten went back to sleep. <laughs> I like that. So what do you think? Was it a magic cat? It could talk. Yeah. That's so silly. Cats can't talk. Neither can dragons. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> can dragons fly? A little. What do you think? Okay, here we go. Ow, your wing hit me in the face. <laughs> do you think dragons can breathe fire? Well, you want to see if I can try? Yes. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. It was nothing. <laughs> want to see it again? Yeah. Here we go. One more time. <laughs> I have a question. I have a question. Are dragons real? Are dragons real? Huh. What am I, tuna fish? <laughs> <laughs> we don't really need to answer that right now, do we? Do we? Oh, of course not. <laughs> well, Scorch is real, and he's here, isn't he? So mm -hmm. he is real. Anyway, you know what we could do? We could go on a picture book visit. <gasps> oh, 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 can we please, please, please? Well, let's go. I know there's a story out there somewhere. Huh. Hey, it's Maria Conchita and Kim at the bookstore. Cool matic They're reading Boragita and the Coyote. On a farm at the foot of a mountain, there once lived a little ewe lamb. Her master called her simply Borreguita, which means little lamb in Spanish. One day, Borreguita's master tied her to a stake in a field of red clover. The lamb was eating the lush plants when a coyote came along. The coyote growled. Borreguita, I'm going to eat you. Borreguita bleated. Señor Coyote, I would not fill you up. I am as thin as a bean pod. When I have eaten all this clover, I shall be fat. You may eat me then. Coyote looked at the skinny little lamb and the wide clover field. Está bien. That is good, he said. When you are fat, I shall come back. After many days, the coyote returned. He found the lamb grazing in a meadow. He growled, 
Borreguita, you are as plump as a tumbleweed. I'm going to eat you now. Borreguita bleated. Be, be, señor coyote. I know something that tastes ever so much better than lamb. What? Asked Coyote. Cheese, cried Borreguita. My master keeps a round of cheese on his table. He eats it on his tacos. Mm. The Coyote had never heard of cheese, and he was curious about it. How can I get some of this cheese, he asked. Borreguita said, there is a pond at the end of the pasture. Tonight, when the moon is high, meet me there, and I will show you how to get a cheese. Está bien, said Coyote. I will be there. That night, when the full moon was straight up in the sky, Borreguita and Coyote met at the edge of the pond. There, glowing in the black water, was something that looked like a big, round cheese. Do you see it? cried Borreguita. Swim out and get it. <laughs> Coyote slipped into the water and paddled toward the cheese. He swam and swam, <sighs> but the cheese stayed just so far ahead. Finally, he opened his mouth and launched. Whoosh! The image shattered in the splash. Pond water rushed into Coyote's mouth. <coughs> Coughing and spluttering, he turned and headed for the shore. When he reached it, the little lamb was gone. Ah, oh, she had tricked him. Coyote shook the water off his fur. <sniffs> then he looked up at the big cheese in the sky and howled. How did he howl? Ooh, right? At dawn the next day, Borreguita went to graze near a small overhanging ledge of rock on the side of the mountain. She knew that the coyote would be coming after her, but she had a plan. As the sun rose over the mountain, Borreguita saw the coyote coming. He was sniffing along with his nose on some trail. She crawled under the ledge and lay on her back, bracing her feet against the top. Well, when the coyote found her, he growled, Borreguita, I see you under there. I'm going to pull you out and eat you. Borreguita bleated, Señor Coyote, you can't eat me now. I have to hold up this mountain. If I let go, it will come tumbling down. The coyote looked at the mountain, and he saw that the lamb was holding it up. You are strong, said Borreguita. Will you hold it while I go for help? The coyote did not want the mountain to fall, so he crept under the ledge and put up his feet. Push hard, said Borreguita. Do you have it now? I have it, said Coyote. But hurry back. This mountain is heavy. Borreguita rolled out of the shallow cave and went leaping and running all the way back to the barnyard. Coyote held up that rock until his legs ached and he was hungry and thirsty. At last he said, even if the mountain falls, I'm going to let go. I can't hold it any longer. The coyote dragged himself out and covered his head with his paws. The mountain did not fall. Ah, then he knew. The little lamb had fooled him again. Coyote sat on his haunches and howled. Oh! Early the next morning, the coyote hid himself in a thicket in the lamb's pasture. When she drew near, he sprang out with a woof, and he said, Borreguita, you will not escape this time. I'm going to eat you now. 
Amiguita, mire. ¡Ve! ¡Ve, señor coyote! I know I deserve to die, but grant me one kindness. Swallow me whole so that I won't have to suffer the biting and the chewing. Hmm. Why should I make you so comfortable while I eat you? Demanded the coyote. Anyway, I couldn't swallow you all in one piece, even if I wanted to. Oh, yes, you could, cried Borreguita. Your mouth is so big, you could swallow a cougar. Open it wide, and I will run and dive right in. Coyote opened his mouth wide, look at that, and braised his feet. You think, I mean, you think it's big enough? I don't know, but let's try and see what happens now. Because Borreguita backed it away. Then she put her head down and charged. Boom! She struck the inside of Coyote's mouth so hard, she sent him rolling. <laughs> Howled the Coyote as he picked himself up and ran away. His mouth feeling like one big toothache. And from that day on, Borreguita frisked about on the farm at the foot of the mountain. And Coyote never bothered her again. And that's the end of the story. Fin. Oh, wow. Wow, that was a cool read. Mm -hmm. Let's do it again. Well, maybe for our next story time. Oh, oh, OK. Hey, did I mention that I have a new library card? Only about 20 times. <laughs> Until our next story time. Keep, Keep a, story a story in your heart. Today's storytime books are The Trouble with Mom by Babette Cole, The Dragon of an Ordinary Family by Margaret Mahi, pictures by Helen Oxenbury, Borreguita and the Coyote by Verna Ardema, illustrated by Petra Mathers. You can find these and other books at your local library. Major funding for storytime is made possible by a grant from Helen and Peter Binks so that families everywhere can share the joy of reading with their children. Additional funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. By the annual financial support from viewers like you. And by the National Endowment for Children's Educational Television. Storytime is a production of KCET Los Angeles.